This is a server, which is probably what you expected a server to look like, and I don't blame you. But technically, any computer that runs services or serves up files can be a server. So how about we build something smaller, like way smaller? I'm talking about using a Raspberry Pi. I want to find out if the newest Raspberry Pi 5 is capable enough to run as an actual home server in your lab. So let's check it out. But first, we'll actually need one. So yeah, servers. We know that when you think about servers, it's usually something like this, right? Micro Center does have servers. And technically, I've gone on record as saying a server can be anything. It doesn't have to be a specific server and workstations server, computer. You can make a home server out of pretty much anything. I've done them out of laptops. I've done them out of regular desktop machines. But today we are doing it out of a Raspberry Pi, which you will not find right here. So let's go to the specific Raspberry Pi aisle and uh, see what we're gonna get. Okay, we made it. It was actually not a far walk at all, but this is the Raspberry Pi section. I think there's two aisles actually, but this is where you'll find the actual Raspberry Pis and they have a pretty decent selection right now. Everything from, I'm seeing Raspberry Pi 3s, here's the 4s, and of course they have the 5s. So depending on what you want, you can choose any of these. We are going with the Raspberry Pi 5 today just to give us the best shot of turning this into a home server. Now I've done videos on all of these. I do know that they can be a home server, but why not go with the most recent one? And a cool thing about the Raspberry Pi 5 is the native NVMe or PCIe lanes on here. Uh, which opens up some pretty cool options. Now you do get a bunch of different hats, or I guess you can call them accessories, but they're called hats because they actually go directly on top of the Raspberry Pi. Uh, the two most popular, I'd say, they have the PoE hat, which lets you power the Raspberry Pi 5 using PoE. And then they also have the M.2 hat, which lets you easily plug in an M.2 NVMe drive, which is the one we are going with today. But there are a lot of cool options here. And at the end of the day, a Raspberry Pi 5 is essentially a developer board, but we're gonna use it to make a server. A couple of cool things, or one that I noticed that was cool is that they have the a PCIe slot for Raspberry Pi 5. So what this is, is essentially turns that little uh, PCIe, it's a ribbon cable on there, but that turns it into an actual 1X slot. But I went with a Pi 5 and the SSD kit, which essentially is the hat that allows me to connect an NVMe drive. And it does come with a 512 gigabyte NVMe drive. Both of those together, let's look at the receipt. 150 bucks for both of these, not bad. If you have an idea of a project in mind, you can probably just come here and get all the sensors and everything you need to do that. It's pretty cool. So they have some basic kits here if you want to start tinkering. Actually, this looks pretty cool. The Inland Smart Home Kit for Arduino, it's Arduino, but I'm sure you could use it for a Raspberry Pi as well. We pretty much have what we need to make a home server here, but the thing we are missing is a case. Now I could just buy a case and hope it fits fine with the hat and everything, but I've been getting into 3D design and 3D printing, so how about we uh, we make our own and they actually have quite a lot of filament over there. So I'm gonna go over there and pick the most outrageous PLA I can find in terms of color. And we're gonna make a case out of that. So how about we go see what they have? There's a lot of PLA here. I'm a 3D printing noob. So let's see, ABS, this is PETG, matte PLA. I think it was something like sparkly, right? Like I'm trying to find the most ridiculous PLA. Regular PLA again, what's over here? PLA plus, I guess at the end of the day, <clears throat> it probably doesn't matter. I just want the most ridiculous color. Yeah, probably like hot pink has gotta be light blue. I already have some of that. I want the hottest of pinks. I want the hottest pink. That sounds spicy. Maybe we do silk pink. Rainbow two. Now that sounds more exotic than silk pink. I don't know, it says rainbow. So I got, oh, wait, what? This says rainbow too. Are these just random col- Oh, oh, they change color. All right, we definitely gotta get this one. So if you look in here, I don't know if you can see it. It's different colors. It's like a uh, gradient. We're definitely getting this. 
Just double check, make sure there's nothing crazy or like Rainbow 3. So I guess I should use this as an opportunity before we check out to mention like kind of the pros and cons of doing something like this. Cause a lot of you are probably thinking, oh, Brett, you mentioned it's $150. I can get an old Dell Optiplex or something for 50 or, you know, go on Facebook marketplace and drop hundred dollars and get something more powerful. Yes, you can. I'm not arguing that. That's, that's never been an, an argument that can be made. But the pros and cons of something like this, pros being if you go with a Raspberry Pi 5, the big one is size. I mean, look at this. This is going to be our server. And this is inside the boxes. It's going to be smaller. And the other thing is power efficiency. The amount of power this is going to use is going to be very much in the single digits. While if you go with something like an Optiplex or something like that, it's going to be bigger. It's going to use more power. The other thing, the, the drawback on these, uh, a con, is that it is an ARM-based system. You will find compatibility issues depending on what software you're trying to run. That's just the nature of running an ARM system. So keep that in mind when you're going with something like this. And the other one is obviously expandability. Going with a regular server, with a regular chassis, with more than a single lane of PCIe Gen 3 is gonna give you the ability to add all kinds of stuff from networking to storage to graphics cards. The world is your oyster in terms of expandability. Here, you, you're very limited. We're going with a single NVMe drive, but for what we wanna do, I think this is gonna be fine. So how about we go home, set this up, and we'll see how this works in terms of software. All right, so one of the main benefits of using the M.2 hat with an NVMe drive is that the Raspberry Pi will run the operating system much faster. To get a Raspberry Pi OS, which will be our server OS, installed on the NVMe drive, we'll have to use the USB to NVMe adapter with the Raspberry Pi imaging software. You could do this on the Raspberry Pi that's already booting from an SD card, but I find this way to be a bit easier. Using the Pi imaging software is great, by the way. You select which operating system you want and then configure things like hostname, password, if you want SSH, all kinds of stuff, and it bakes it right into the install. Then just select your NVMe drive and boom, you're done. After putting the drive back in, you're up and running. As you can see, I have quite the colorful case using my fancy filament. I think if you had a larger project that used more material, it would end up looking cooler with more colors and stuff, but this is fine. I did end up just stealing a design because I didn't really plan on doing anything custom, so this is definitely a bit underwhelming. Oops. But anyway, we have our Pi up and running, and to be a true server, we are going to need one of three things. To host VMs, run Docker containers, or to serve files over the network. We are going to be doing two of those things, Docker and file serving. To get Docker installed, you're gonna run sudo apt install docker io, and from here, you are free to use Docker as you'd like. Personally, I always run Portainer since it's a nice orchestrator for Docker and has some Docker Compose integration. So we'll just follow the docs to get that up and running, then navigating to the host port, we are ready to run some containers. Now I did go with the 16 gigabyte version of the Pi 5, which is nice if you're looking to spin up a decent amount of containers. Most people aren't really pushing their Pi's to the limit, but hey, I don't know your life. If you need 16 gigs on your Raspberry Pi, then who am I to judge? Now, obviously we can spin up the basics like Nginx, Pi Hole, some kind of dashboard, whatever you want. There's no shortage of apps that can be run via Docker, so get out there and start trying stuff out. The one thing to note here, and is something that I mentioned at Micro Center, is that the Pi is an ARM-based machine, so make sure that the container you're running has an ARM image, because if it doesn't, yeah, it, it won't work. The big test, though, when deploying containers and apps is finding out if we can host a media server. I think we're long past the days of needing a big, dedicated machine to run Plex, and I think there are two reasons for that. One is that computers are just getting insanely efficient. We're seeing a ton of power crammed into small footprints, which I'm here for. The other is that so many devices now natively support common codecs like H.264 and H.265, meaning that there is less of a need for real-time transcoding, and that's what typically uses up a lot of your resources, especially if your machine doesn't have dedicated hardware transcoding, but that's getting way into the weeds. Let's just see how Plex runs on this Raspberry Pi. To get Plex up and running, we're gonna use the default Docker Compose file and paste that into a custom template and portainer. We'll then have to change the location of where our legally obtained media is stored, so you'll wanna go ahead and do that. 
Once we have that, just save it, run it, and navigate to port 32400, which will guide you through the setup. It's really no different from any other machine, and that is the beauty of Docker. For the most part, setting up apps is going to be exactly the same on a Raspberry Pi as it is on a 96-core Epic system with 2 terabytes of RAM and everything in between. In terms of performance, it's great. Over the local network, we never really have to do any transcoding, so you'll have no issues running multiple streams at once. If you do end up having to do transcoding for whatever reason, it's fine. I mean, don't expect to be able to do it for a bunch of streams at once, and you'll certainly see your CPU starting to sweat, so if you're running other stuff on here, you may see a performance bouncy. But come on, this thing is using like 5 watts and can fit in your pocket. The other feature that makes a server is the ability to serve files over the network, essentially functioning as a NAS. Oftentimes, you'll deploy a dedicated NAS software like TrueNAS, OpenMediaVault, Unraid, or any of the other options out there. However, basically none of those outside of OpenMediaVault will run on an ARM system, so we'll have to do this a bit manually. Now, right now, we only have a 512GB NVMe drive, which isn't much, and we don't really have the space to add more, so I guess we're gonna give up, right? Yep, thanks for watching. Now, we're going to utilize a DAS, or Direct Attached Storage. This is basically a secondary piece of hardware that contains one or more drives that attaches directly to the host machine, usually over USB for consumer devices. I've got this big old TerraMaster DAS over here that I've used in the past and it's been great. A single USB-C connection gives me access to six hard drives. You will be limited by the speed of your USB connection, but for most systems, that's at least five gigabit per second. So for hard drives, that's not terrible. I'm just gonna use one of these generic external SSDs to keep the complexity and power usage down. And yeah, you just kind of plug it into one of the USB slots and uh, it's kind of it. I may as well at least plug it in now. I know it's been off because it's kind of easier to flail around when it's not plugged into anything, but there. So when you plug in a drive, you should be able to use LSBLK and see the drive listed. If there's no partition already, or if you've already deleted it, then we'll go ahead and make one using FDisk. Here we can just hit N to create a new partition, then W to save it. Once we have a partition, we can then put a file system on it. Since we are using Linux system, we will go with good old ext4, and you can do this with mkfs. Now we have our external drive with a file system ready to be mounted. To mount it, we'll first need a location where we want it to be mounted to. So I created a directory in the slash mnt directory called external. This next piece is to get the UUID of the drive so that we can mount based on that rather than the device name, as sometimes that changes. After getting the UUID, we can use this to create an entry in our fstab file to make sure that this is mounted on boot. And once that's done, we have our external drive mounted to the system and we can use it however we see fit. This would be a good location to store larger files, like if you're hosting a media server or maybe sharing files across the network. Speaking of sharing files over the network, we are going to set that up using Samba. So we'll go ahead and install that using app, and just like before, we're going to create a directory for our share. Since this is on our external drive, we are going to create a share folder in the MNT external directory, which may be used as a dedicated share folder. To actually create the share, we're gonna edit the Samba configuration file, and at the very bottom, we're gonna go ahead and create a new entry. We're gonna give it a name in brackets, and then add attributes like a comment, the location of the directory, who can access it, and other stuff you can look up in the documentation. Our share is pretty basic, so we don't really have much to add here. Once that's done, we will have to ensure that we have a Samba user, which is different from our regular Linux users. Luckily, that's easy to do as we can use the SMB passwd, which will set the password and create the user at the same time. Then we're good to go. Our share is accessible over the network using the IP address of the Pi and the name we gave to the share. We can access this from any machine, whether that's Windows, Linux, or Mac OS, and it'll function just like any other Samba share. Pretty neat. And there you have it, a Raspberry Pi 5 deployed as a capable home server. Is it perfect? Now, there are software incompatibilities, the expansion is limited, in general, it's just not super powerful. However, a lot of the times that doesn't matter. If you have a specific use case to run some containers, serve up some files, and wanna do that with a device that takes up virtually no space and only sips a few watts, 
this is perfect. That's all I have for this one. If you liked it, then drop a like and subscribe if you want to see more Home Lab shenanigans. I want to give a huge shout out to my YouTube members and my Patreons. You guys are my Raspberry Pi server that runs all the containers and fits nice and cozy down in my pocket. Y'all are the best. And if you're still watching, you're an ESP32. Thank you so much, and I'll see you in the next one.